Hello and welcome to Synth and Self. My name is Jacques Mongrel and today I'm going to flip things around and first I'm going to tell you about myself and then I'm going to talk about synths and electronic music. Uh, I was born in the early 80s uh, in a town uh, just outside of Barcelona. Uh, it was an industrial town. It had a industrial heritage uh, which influenced me in, in, in many ways. My dad worked on uh, mainframe computers uh, for uh, Spanish corporations um, back when computing was a very new thing in Spain. And uh, computer bugs uh, were literally insects that were messing up uh, a circuit board uh, in these very big machines. Uh, so computing has been part of my life from a very early age. I remember as a kid, uh, we had a, a, a Z80, a Sinclair um, Z80 computer um, at, the, at home. It was, I was really young. Um, and then also later on, my dad had some educational um, circuit board based computers, like kind of kit based computers that were essentially just like a, a Zilog chip uh, with an LCD screen and you program them by using uh, hex code and, and uh, low level programming languages. Uh, so that was uh, my time in Spain. Um, around the time, around age eight or nine, uh, I moved to France. Uh, and I went to school there. Uh, I learned French by just simply going to school. I, I, it took me two years to basically uh, feel that I had a comfortable level of, of French um, just by being in school and being in, in the regular uh, stream of classes. Uh, and I made some friends there and, and computing kind of continued and I discovered games. Um, I remember a, a friend of mine who had a an Amstrad CPC computer and a game called Rick Dangerous, um, which uh, which was really fun um, and visually kind of st stuck with me. Also in France, um, at that time, uh, this was before the internet, and um, in France you had a, this kind of uh, video text system called Minitel, uh, which you basically rented a terminal from the post office and you could do things like check the weather, book flights, uh, check cinema listings. Essentially, a lot of things that we do now on the internet were done in a slightly more primitive manner on these uh, video text terminals. So that was, uh, we had one of those at home because uh, they were very affordable. Um, and so that was another kind of piece of technology that... that uh, affected me or that, that had an impact uh, on me. Uh, and the first kind of piece of network technology, because you basically, uh, it hooked up to, to a phone line, it was very slow, like the display would like update line by line as, as it loaded the page and you pre selected an option and it went to a different page and again line, line by line um, to display uh, the information. Uh, but that was, that was uh, I remember that and it definitely uh, left an impact. Um, also, French TV. There was a lot like French TV was pretty um, out there in terms of, for example, they showed like anime, fairly kind of uh, violent anime uh, <laughs> on like Saturday morning uh, kid slots, um, and also like weird uh, francophone uh, TV shows. One of them was called Delisha, and it was this. Um, uh, anthropomorphic cat that who was a reporter and he uh, interviewed day-to-day um, -day objects like telephones and um, and washing machines and also he would uh, there was a segment where he would interview uh, a gluon from um, like different types of materials it was very strange a uh, very strange show, and also kind of viewing it later, also very um, uh, very cynical about society. It, it took uh, a lot of jabs at uh, consumer culture, um, 
kind of in a very stealthy way so that kids it wasn't you know registering with kids on a frontal kind of level but um definitely it it was uh it was quite an interesting experience that um stuck with me after france i uh my family moved to the uk uh and that's where i went to high school at that point i had been learning english uh from the time that i was in spain so from early on so uh moving to england was a much easier kind of adjustment than than moving to france because i was already very comfortable with the language um so i went to high school and then uh university uh in england and um technologically what what uh, influenced me this was right before the internet kind of hit critical mass at least in 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 the uk and for someone who was a you know a teenager um the in the uk there was there, there were these um uk specific computer brands one was the bbc micro and the other one was uh the acorn archimedes um and uh so that's the computers that that we had at school and i used those pretty heavily that that was really when beforehand computers had been something that i was interested in but i was pretty young so i wasn't using them in any profound way or or but so really was when I, when i was in high school and i had access uh to computers for an extended period of time that um i became more familiar with um you know with image editing and uh games and some basic html programming and all that kind of stuff and so the computers that i explored that with uh w- it was the the acorn archimedes which is interesting because it was a computer that kind of looked like a uh an amiga a, co- uh, a commodore amiga or or even a, a, an atari st so kind of like a keyboard with um with a disk drive on the side and it hooked up to it could actually even hook up to a TV um but uh uh what's interesting about it is that it used a risk processor and in fact the the Acorn computer company went bust but before they went bust they spun out the they or they licensed the the processor technology uh, the the risk uh, architecture and that kind of uh they l- licensed that off and that became arm and so when you think about you know the the uh processors in your mobile phones and and um so sort of compact devices uh it all comes from this company it all comes from uh this uh computer that was marketed at the education sector and um initially it wasn't they didn't want to f- a low power um processor which is you know why risk processors are used in mobile devices um but because it was a, a much simpler processor to manufacture hence the reduced instruction set um architecture um as opposed to the intel processors which were uh much more complex but with that uh that uh, with the acorn computer um it was funny because you had to have you know hard drives were still pretty expensive so you had to have um a disk with your programs on it what was interesting is that unlike other computers like say the the mac um the early macs the the classic mac the acorn had the operating system on a rom chip so to upgrade the the operating system you had to open the computer and take out the rom chip and and replace it uh but it meant that you didn't need a system disk and it meant that uh the system booted up uh very quickly for the time sometime i think when i was 17 or 16 uh we got a a home computer and that was a a, a windows 95 pc i believe it was a like a, it was a cyrix uh processor which was a kind of pentium clone at the time and um uh yeah so i remember like playing red alert uh command and conquer uh also a oh, little big adventure that was another one uh weird french game it's pretty cool if you can track it down uh and then uh that was really the point where i got into 
electronic music. First, it was through this uh, shareware program called uh, Orangator or Orangator. Orangator. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how I got it because I don't think the, co the computer wasn't hooked up to the internet. Um, so it must have been through a demo CD from a magazine or something. But it was basically a. a an offline synthesizer, if I remember correctly, where you would program the 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 sound, um, and you could enter a sequence of notes, and then you basically hit print, and it it uh, computed the the wave file, the resulting wave file based on on uh, the settings that you had put in, and that was my introduction to weird electronic sounds, and that was uh, really interesting. Um, very soon after that, I discovered. Uh, Fruity Loops, um, it was Fruity Loops 3, and it was like one of the early sort of 3.1 or 3.2. It was a point release that basically really expanded the, the possibilities of that from just a simple kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of drum loop creator to something where you could create more of a an extended composition. And that was really the beginning for, with electronic uh, music for me because uh, I had access to all of these uh, different plugins and synth sounds um, and sequencing, uh, and it ran uh, quite well on a on a lowly uh, Windows ninety five computer. Uh, then uh, I went off to college or university, whatever you want to call it, and uh, I got a. Uh, a 486 laptop with a passive scan screen, which meant that everything was super ghosty uh, whenever you moved the mouse. But I was able to run Fruity Loops on that, uh, and so I continued experimenting uh, with with composition. I didn't really write full songs. It would be like short loops. Like really, I was really into experimenting with the sounds. I remember there was a um, uh, an image synth where you could load in a small bitmap image and it generated a sound by analyzing the the, the bitmap image and you would get these very weird uh, soundscapes out of it that uh, that were really interesting. Um, then towards the end of college, uh, university, um, I think I discovered the Buzz plugins that uh, could go into. So this was a plugin standard, um, Jascola Buzz, I think was was the name of it. And there, there were lots, and and there was some. Uh, I remember I remember specifically a uh, a sort of uh, a synth with a with a formant filter, and I was, you know just blown, uh, my mind was blown by by the possibilities of that, of these vocal articulations that were possible. I was really into music by that point. By that point, I, I was really into like indie rock, a band called Super Furry Animals. That also was kind of a gateway because they incorporated uh, electronic sounds and they would start a song that was like a rock song or, a, you know, a indie pop song. And then it would kind of morph towards the end um, into a sort of an electronic jam. Um, like there's a song called Mountain People by them from, from their second album that does that. And it's just, it goes from this uh, kind of, I, they, they were very influenced by prog rock and, and the Beach Boys. And it starts off like that. And then it ends in like 303 madness basically and synth madness at the end. And it's, it's pretty incredible. So, that got me more interested in that, but I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't figure out how to perform those sounds live, so I was also playing guitar at the time, um, so I was kind of in between those two worlds, the synth and the sort of the the rock world, you know, playing guitar and kind of jamming with other students. Um, but one thing that I did do is that I... Um, Starting doing visuals uh, at nightclubs uh, as a kind of side gig, I had a job at a at a video store, um, and uh, what I would do is I would take uh, I would you know borrow tapes from the video store, and I would essentially make VHS mixtapes at the university media center where I could like overdub with two uh, video machines. Um, different scenes from different films and kind of edit them together to make a, a video mixtape. And then I would take that to um, a uh, to 
local nightclubs and um, and just like play them. Um, and to do that, I would borrow <laughs> the uh, projector from my university, uh, the, like from the media department. Um, and a uh, funny story, like uh, one day I borrowed the projector and they were like, please, yeah, please bring it back uh, because we have to set it up for for this really big uh, soccer game that people want to watch on the big screen. So you need to bring it back. And it was a really long night and I fell asleep and the projector was in my room and I was woken up like, uh, I don't know at what time, but people were just banging at my door because <laughs> they wanted the projector. And I went there to set it up for them since, you know, it was late. And you had like 100 people watching this seminal football, a uh, soccer game on like a small TV in the center of the room. And I'll never forget that, that image. Um, I think a lot of people were annoyed with me <laughs> that day. But uh, to, that's just to say that basically I, I, that's what I would do. I would um, get free tapes from the video store, mix them up at the media center, and then I would uh, lug around this really heavy projector to nightclubs. I would set it up. And I, actually, I would also, um, since it was multiple inputs, I would plug in a um, uh, uh, my laptop, and I would actually play uh, games on an emulator. And I would switch between uh, the video mixtape and the, and I would play the, I don't know, Sonic or whatever live uh, as visuals for the, for the nightclub. And this was um, at a time. Um, it, this was the, in the UK, like in the early 2000s. So like the you know, Beats, uh, Breakbeat, uh, Fatboy Slim, stuff like that was really popular. Uh, Rare Groove as well. Um, so like. Uh, I did visuals for a, for a, uh, like a bunch of ninja tune artists that came through the clubs um to like to DJ um and it was it was it was lots of fun. Um okay now uh I had a year abroad in the middle of my university uh time um to study abroad and it was in Geneva and uh that presented me with a very kind of different nightlife scene in the uk clubs opened at like at eight or nine and they closed at two and there was a big emphasis on like getting really drunk and uh and yeah basically getting plastered um but in uh, in geneva it was it was different uh the clubs it would well first of all it was a squat there was this squat called uh, luzine which was a former gold refinery or or i think maybe minting um coin mint that was uh n near a river it was just next to a river and it was this big building and it in fact it housed two clubs but it was derelict so it had been taken over um and it was legal uh or i mean it was it was tolerated by the by the city um but the the club nights ran a lot longer. Like it, the night started at maybe eleven, and they went on to seven in the morning. So that was a very different feeling. And um, so drinking wasn't that that much of a, you know, people weren't really uh, drinking so much because they had to <laughs> to be awake for for a much longer time. And there was a much more of an emphasis on on just the on dancing and. Um, and just uh, experiencing the whole night, essentially. Um, and in Geneva, I saw artists like DMX Crew, uh, Zombie Nation. Um, so it was like uh, Electro Clash was big at that time. And then Miss Kitten was in Geneva as well at that time. Um, and just the parties were, were long and, and sort of decadent. And I remember, for example, Zombie Nation, when he played live, like he had a problem with his machines and only a kick drum was coming through. And he grabbed one of the, of the monitors that was on the floor and just like put it like on his, on his shoulder. And he was just like rocking to it as if it was like a boom box. And it was just insane, that kind of, that kind of stuff. And uh, I made some friends there, and also there was one gig that was um, kind of really impacted me, and um, it was I think it was when DMX Crew played, um, and he was really great. But th that night there was a guy called Khan, um, who 
was part of a house duo called Captain Comatose. And uh, he wasn't like on the on the flyer or anything. He was passing through. Um, and he basically just got on stage in between two performances. They kind of uh, fit his life set in there. And I say life set, but you'll see what I mean. And he basically just hooked up a, a mini disc player and that kind of... <laughs> puts it in the context of the era. He hooked up a mini a mini disc player to the PA of the of the club and just with a microphone just did a whole live set just singing along to his backing tracks and it was like really powerful. It was this impromptu, it felt super punk. He had this great voice and uh, he kind of pranced around the stage, stood over the the turntables and that to me really it really opened my eyes because it was electronic music but the emphasis was on the voice the emphasis was on the performer um it wasn't about noodling it was really it was about the moment and he then he like got into the crowd and uh and that was um yeah that it was a really powerful uh a really powerful uh experience uh, to see that after university, I moved to Paris, um, and uh, there I continued writing music uh, with Fruity Loops on my laptop, um, and I started to, uh, I, I kind of defined the type of music that I wanted to write, so like synth pop uh, with vocals, and um, inspired by what I had seen in Geneva, I started to perform in uh, uh, local bars and open mic nights. Um, and uh, I also got a um, Casio CZ5000 on Craigslist. And I got that, and uh, which was a very interesting synth uh, with a very particular sound. Um, very easy to use, actually, even though it has a, a button-driven interface. Um, and uh, a very unique sound that I, I've it is hard to find outside of the of the Casio range uh, because of the phase distortion uh, synthesis. Uh, when I was in university, I discovered a radio station called uh, the Cybernetic Broadcasting System. That was a big deal. That got me. That introduced me to uh, Italo disco, um, classic disco, uh, and then kind of um, the what's known as the Hague sound, artists like Lego Velt, uh, Bunker Records, um, Org Electronique, um, and uh, IF, uh, who I also saw DJ in Paris. He's an incredible DJ. His mix, uh, mixed up in the Hague, volumes one and two are, are like required listening if uh, you want to know more about Italo Disco and, and sort of 80s, uh, new wave and the the sort of the underside of of uh, 80s pop and 80s kind of club music, um, especially uh, especially in Europe. Uh, and then, uh, so while I was in Paris, actually, I did, I did a a radio show, a short radio show for that radio station, um, and the cyber, the cybernetic broadcasting system then became uh, Intergalactic FM. Uh, which continues to broadcast uh, to this day. Um, after Paris, I moved to the U.S., uh, where I currently live. I, uh, I live on the East Coast. Um, and uh, that meant that I, um, I abandoned uh, Fruity Loops finally. I was pretty much hitting the limit uh, of what I could do, what I feel I could do with that, um, with with that software because I was still using Fruity Loops three, uh, three point five or, or or something like that, and so I switched over to Ableton Live. I got an audio interface. Um, I got a microcorg, and um, that for that developed my my sound further. But then uh, two or three years ago, I expanded my studio more significantly. Um, I got a couple of Electron boxes. Um, and then I started to look into modular. Which, so now that's basically like my setup it has pretty much stabilized to uh, Ableton Live, um, the modular, a couple of electron boxes, and the microcorg. And that's basically a, a whistle stop tour of uh, how I came to 
uh, be interested in synthesizers and electronic music. Now I'd like to talk about some videos that I recently uploaded to the channel in the past couple of months. Uh, the first one is the demo of the WMD uh, SSF Ultrafold module. Uh, it's a wave folder. Um, and I demonstrated it using, I think, Square and uh, Saw Waves. And uh, I, it's an incredible module, just the, the idea of wave folding. I wasn't that familiar with it. Um, there's a saturation plugin on Ableton that, that uh, has wave folding, which I had used before. But um, aside from that, I wasn't really familiar with it in a, in a synth context. Um, so I was surprised just by the range of tones. Um, you could get like some quite FM metallic distorted sounds, but then also some uh, more subtle uh, filtered sounds, even though I didn't have the, the filter in the, in the patch, uh, you're really able to, to get quite a range of, uh, of timbral uh, uh, variations, basically. So I recommend that if you would like to see how that works, that you check that video. And I'll put links and um, various ways of getting to that uh, in the description below and, uh, and around my face. Um, <laughs> The next video that I'd like to talk about that I did recently um, was uh, Rico's uh, Security Connection, and this was a, um, a track that I worked on uh, with a friend of mine from Miami, uh, Daniel, who has a studio uh, down there. And basically, we used a, a bunch of his synths and um, had the Octatrack be kind of the master clock and um, everything was sampled into the Octatrack. And uh, basically what we did is we worked on on uh, several standalone, standalone loops, and then when I came back to uh, the studio, I then fleshed it out. And so Rico Security Connection is, uh, is an example of that. Um, and it kind of follows up from uh, The Astronaut's Mistress, which is another video that I did from, this, from the same based on the, or another song that I did based on the same session. Uh, and then before that, it was uh, Miami Date Freaky Zone, um, also from the same session. And uh, it was great because I got to use and, and see Daniel use uh, some synths that I, I wasn't that familiar with, um, things like the, the Moog uh, Sub 37, um, and then also uh, some vintage synths like the Korg MS-20 and the um, and a, a Juno 106, I think. Uh, so that that was that was really cool. And then also uh, the MFB Tans Bar, which has a really great sound. And he he has an interesting setup because he has uh, the the Tans Bar running through, and actually a couple of the other synths as well, running through some uh, some guitar effects pedal uh, pedals, including a Mutron flanger or phaser, if, if I remember correctly, and, um, and a rat uh, distortion pedal, uh, which sounds really great. It's noisy as hell, especially the, uh, the, the Mutron, but, but really quite tasty sounding. Also, another video that I did recently was a uh, just a demo uh, running through the, all the different sounds from uh, the Entangled Species um, sound, uh, sound pack that uh, AAS put out uh, alongside Ableton uh, for uh, their instrument uh, tension, which is a, a string modeling uh, synthesizer. Um, and uh, it's really cool because you know, uh, it's, uh, tension is a is a physical modeling synthesizer based on the model of a stringed instrument, right? Uh, it's as if you had a, uh, a an algebra formula or a, a guitar reduced to an algebra formula with variables like string length, uh, string tension, uh, the size of the of the resonating body, um, where you pluck the string. Uh, where you you press down on the string and and whether whether you pluck it or whether you hit it with a with a mallet or some kind of thing and then you can you can define the the hardness of the of the surface of the mallet uh, you can add dampening as well so 
a whole swathe of sounds is, is possible. And uh, it really makes you think about sound design in a very different way than a traditional subtractive synthesizer. Um, so this, um, uh, which sometimes can be a little bit hard to get, around, uh, you know, to get your head wrapped around. Uh, so this sound pack um, I got and uh, I was really impressed because it really pushes uh, the sounds beyond the strict physical modeling interpretation of the synthesizer into uh, sort of ambient and atmospheric territories, uh, but then also some really usable melodic sounds, um, leads and pads, and, and uh, also a couple of basses that, that sound really good. Uh, so if you kind of want to see if that pack sound pack is uh is something that that might uh give you access to new kinds of sounds then check that video uh also i've uh put out a couple of microcorg uh sound demos again in the same spirit uh just running through different sounds from uh from its uh preset banks um just to show what's possible. I mean, it's uh, the microcorg never ceases to surprise me because, um, and I've been thinking about it, especially with the, the release of, of the Minilog uh, synthesizer by Korg, uh, which is a four voice polyphonic analog uh, synthesizer. Uh, the microcorg is also four voice polyphonic. Uh, so, you know, I was like thinking about it and, uh, and how kind of the, you know, what, what the two instruments kind of share in terms of, of heritage, even though they're uh, apples and oranges because of of their um, sort of synth technology. Uh, but the microcore, because it has those W uh, waves, those, um, those early digital uh, waves from the DW synths, uh, it, it has uh, a palette of sounds that is, is quite surprising. And then you have the two layer system which while it does uh, cut down your polyphony, it really does open up uh, quite a lot of, of sounds. And, and the quality of the sounds is, is really something that I think uh, is a testament to the instrument and to the, to the durability, I mean, to the, to the continuing popularity of, of, the, of the synth, um, just because it has a, such, a, such a wide range of sounds. And, um, as you use it, it becomes easier to tweak and to and to program as you memorize kind of the uh, the structure of the of the synth engine, uh, moving from row to row to to do uh, your settings. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, you might have a microcorg lying around, uh, looking at those sounds um, or listening to those sounds rather. Uh, you know, might inspire you to to dust it off and and see what you can use it for. Um, I've gotten a couple of comments in those videos asking for um, the patches, and uh, I need to look into how to get them off the microcorg. I know that probably there's a uh, a SysX uh, um, software thing where where I can I can download the the MIDI data, uh, but I just need a little bit of time to to figure that out. So um, there's a couple of people that have requested specific patches, and then I've kind of gone the old school way of of just writing down the parameters in in the comment. But I will look into um, getting that MIDI data uh, off the microcorg so I can share it with you guys. Uh, another creative video that I did was uh, I downloaded um, a sample pack from Legovelt. Uh, I, I want to say that it was uh, maybe the, the, the JD800, I think. Uh, I think it, it was... So Legovelt is, a, is, a, is an artist that I like a lot. He has... He is, a, I mean, a synth overlord, um, and he's released countless uh, records under various names and in many different styles. And he, he ran a record label for, for a number of years as well. Um, uh, he's Dutch and he, he, I mean, he plays around the world, so he's uh, fairly easy to, to get. And I'll post a link to his website. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's got a great personality and, um, uh, and I love his music. So uh, he he released a sample pack. F I think I'm pretty sure it, I it was the one for the the for a, 
an early role on digital synth. Um, I won't say the JD800. Uh, put that into the Octatrack, and uh, I just built a, a song from the from his sounds. Um, it was the, his sounds are really inspiring, and and they have very much his imprint um, filtered with some modulation, um, kind of evolving. Um, uh, with a kind of vintage, wistful quality to them, uh, but very, very usable, very usable and very, very atmospheric. They they draw you in, uh, whatever synth he's using. And and um, there's a, I think it's Fact Magazine. There's a documentary that shows his studio. I mean, his studio is basically just a home filled with synths. Um, it, there's a supercut where he which takes every time he uses the word synth in this one hour long documentary as he presents his collection. And um, it's, uh, it's quite funny. So it was, it was lots of fun to make that, that track from his samples. And that's really kind of what's been happening on the channel. Um, let me talk about some things that have inspired me recently uh, in terms of music and, uh, and art. Um, there, first, a shout out to a um, YouTuber called uh, Midera. I'll pop a link to his channel in the in the description. Um, he he does a lot of like very atmospheric jams. Um, he uses a synth called the Spectralis. Um, his stuff sounds really good, and it's also beautifully shot, um, really highlighting the work that he does. Um, so I've enjoyed a couple of his videos recently. Um, also, uh, Sonic State, uh, uh, Gaz Williams published um, or interviewed um, a guy who is uh, directing uh, a sort of retrospective, a musical retrospective of uh, Barry Gray's music. Barry Gray is the British composer uh, for TV and film who did um, all of the music for the Jer Jerry Anderson uh, Super Mario Nation uh, productions uh, like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. Captain Scarlet is one of uh, my favorite TV shows uh, from when I was a kid. Definitely haunted me for, for many years. Captain Black was the stuff of nightmares uh, for, uh, for a very long time. I think this was in Bristol and um, Jarvis Cocker performed uh, in it and uh, also I think uh, a guy from Portishead, and they had um, like some really. In, uh, they had a essentially a, a, f a full ensemble, a musical ensemble, and then also they had someone who played uh, the On de Martino, uh, French synthesizer, which Barry Gray used um, uh, for for his soundtrack work, and it's actually his personal uh, uh, On de Martino, and it sounds incredible. Um, it was like using different types of speakers uh, to kind of, as part of the synthesis process in a way. It was, a, it was an early uh, kind of pre-Moog uh, electronic instrument. I won't say electronic, but I think that might be a misnomer. Kind of um, synthesizer, electric instrument um, of sorts. It had a vibrato on the keyboard, the whole keyboard, could kind of you know you could hit a key and it you could wiggle your finger and it would it would vibrate the tone, um, quite remarkable. And then also the guy from Portishead was playing uh, the Swarmatron, um, which is a, a more recent instrument um, that featured in the uh, in the soundtrack for the Social Network. Um, very very interesting analog instrument. Um, so it was really inspiring to. Uh, to see that uh, interview, Gaz Williams did a, a really great job to capturing the the excitement and the um, the kind of the pioneering spirit. You know, this was the in the '60s and early '70s of um, Barry Gray incorporating new sounds into traditional uh, soundtrack um, composition, uh, and also it, it just made me go back and, and watch a couple of Captain Scarlet episodes and. Um, and I have the soundtrack, so I re-listened to that and listening to like to, to the theme, which on the face of it is very kitsch, but it has some really interesting arrangements. And again, this marrying of traditional um, 
kind of swinging 60s sounds and and um, sort of easy listening kind of uh, tropes with um, early synthesizers and an early kind of otherworldly sounds uh, is is pretty cool. And then melodically, uh, there's uh, there's something that's that's quite unique and that really uh, captures your your imagination. Um, so that that's been uh, inspiring me um, a fair amount. Also, I'm looking forward to seeing now totally different part of the world, totally different era. Um, I hope I'm saying his name his name right. Um, I'm going to go and see uh, Onatrix Point Never. Um, his name is his real name is Daniel Lopatan, I think, um, and he uh, he's kind of famous for. Um, Sort of doing vaporwave before vaporwave in in a way it's kind of a uh, plunderphonics, um, pretty experimental kind of electronic music that has a a, a very um, enthusiastically digital is how I would like to call it a very uh, consciously digital kind of sound and it kind of uses uh, it borrows. Uh, sounds that that we immediately connect with you know um tv kind of uh music stings and sort of little eye dents um and he just uh melds that all together with some uh identifiable kitschy digital sounds um from like the 90s um i th i think i was listening to to one of his albums uh, r plus seven um and even more recently his latest one garden of delete and i i think i could hear a a, a yamaha tg33 which i owned and there was like this preset that has it sounds like um sort of falling pebbles or falling coins over a over an atmospheric pad. I was like, uh huh, I recognize that. Um, so I'm excited to see what uh, that looks like live. Oh, uh, today I saw a video on Vimeo that was really cool, and I'll pop a link in the description, both for uh, uh, Onatrix, Point Never, and um, uh, this was a, a band called, I believe it was Angles, and it looks like Tip Top Audio, uh, the, the um, Eurorack Modular Manufacturer is starting a record label, or has started a record label. Uh, that was something else that I enjoyed. Um, and then, also, I've been working on a track. Um, I think I'll probably end on, on this. Uh, I've been working on a track recently on Ableton. So it kind of starts off um, on, an, on an electro tip, and then it kind of switches back and forth as the, as the track progresses, but pretty happy with it. And uh, actually, as I was making it, I recorded, uh, I screen capped um, the process a little bit. So um, I think I'm, I'm probably gonna leave you with that. I'm hoping to do uh, more of these uh, to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes um, perspective on, on what I do. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the, in the description and check the description for links to stuff that I've referenced uh, in this in this video. Thank you for watching.
Thank you.